Welcome everybody to a mindful social chat. I'm really excited this week to have Jessica with us. She's known on Twitter as the Peaceful Professor, which is a really interesting name. And I think I'm gonna let you tell us a little bit about how you got that and a little bit about where you're going. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'm so happy to be here today and chatting with you, Janet. Um, uh, we were chatting before the recording began about, you know, the beauty of social media connecting people all over the world. And, you know, that's just serendipity is how Janet and I, I got together. Um, so happy to be here. And yes, um, one of my Twitter handles, I do actually have a couple. Uh, one of my Twitter handles is The Peaceful Professor. And it's actually a new handle um, to reflect uh, a relatively new project. So um, I like to describe myself as a, a recovering academic <laughs> in, the, in the sense that I had a pretty traditional trajectory um, after college. I, I knew I wanted to be a college professor. Uh, I wanted to teach at the college level. And so I pursued my master's and then my PhD. Um, so I got my PhD in communication in 2010 from the University of Tennessee and Knoxville. And, uh, and after that, I, I was a lecturer, I was an adjunct, I was a visiting assistant professor. So I had all these like temporary positions in academia. And to be honest with you, um, it just got exhausting. It was just mm. emotionally exhausting to never get that tenure track job that so many PhDs are after because, you know, as many of you know, tenure equals pretty much permanence unless you do something awful. So Security. that's right. Yes, Security exactly. good. Yes, exactly. So I desperately wanted to be a professor, but it just life had other things in mind for me. So, um, but from my 10 years teaching in higher education um, and interacting with other educators and interacting with college students, I started to notice um, a lot of depression and anxiety and just general unhappiness um, mm -hmm. amongst both college students and professors. So a lot of college students, I mean, we know from the, the research that um, suicide is the number one cause of death for young adults. I mean, that just baffles me. And so I interacted with a lot of students over the years who struggled with depression and other mental illnesses. And then I saw a lot of just unfulfillment and unhappiness amongst my colleagues. And so I thought, you know, something's going on here. And I noticed that in a lot of K through 12, um, in K through 12 education, that there are some um, movements towards implementing mindfulness and meditation practices in the classroom, mm -hmm. and that they've had some really amazing results just in terms of students' attention and staying on task and um, reducing things like suspensions. I mean, really fantastic results in K through 12. But that hadn't reached college and universities. Um, and so a lot of times at colleges, the only entity on campus that deals with mental health and stress and depression and anxiety is the counseling center. Um, mm -hmm. And they're so overwhelmed with the, the demand from students to get in there. Oftentimes there's a wait list um, and the counseling center doesn't even address employees or professors' mental health. So I thought that there was a gap and so this new project, The Peaceful Professor, is my attempt to make college campuses a little bit happier, a little bit healthier through the practices of mindfulness. Um, so it's a new project. I'm really excited about it. It's just getting off the ground. Um, so any of you out there who would like to contribute maybe a blog post or something, reach out to me. I'd love to have multiple contributors to this website, to this blog. Um, so that's pretty much how I arrived at um, the name and the idea of the Peaceful Professor. That's a wonderful idea. I think, you know, it's what's going to be really interesting is when those kids that are in, you know, middle school now and taking mindfulness training come to college. But that's a whole generation away. And for you to kind of fill that gap is a fabulous idea. Because I know what I was like when I was in college and the stress level is really high. The you know, over medicating to kind of deal with your day is part of that. Oh, yes. Um, sure. Some of it, you know, youthful exuberance. Sure. But, sure. but some of it is simply stress. Yeah. 
and finding ways for the kids and the professors mm -hmm. to deal with that is, is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean, the we have a lot of data about um, teacher burnout for K through 12 teachers. Um, mm -hmm. We know that something like, I think a roughly 41% of K through 12 teachers leave within five years of starting the profession. I mean, that's scary. We don't have that same data for higher education. Um, so we don't know much about the stress um, and you know, mental well-being of professors, and so I'm I'm attempting to kind of get that conversation going because you're right, there there is a gap. Um, but I am I'm I'm really actually intrigued and looking forward to see how these kids who are now in middle school and high school once they reach college, if if we'll notice any differences because there are, um, depending on, I mean, not surprisingly, a lot of these programs to implement mindfulness in the classroom or, you know, on the West Coast in California and stuff. So not as much in the South where I'm from, um, but I'm hoping that this practice grows so that we do kind of intervene before they get to those super stressful times um, that they'll experience in college. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, Gail asks if you're holding live mindful events on campus. Ah, not yet, but that's actually something that I'm, I'm hoping to work on. If you're interested in seeing what I personally think is a really great model um, is the university, I believe it's the University of Washington. They have a completely student-led mindfulness group on campus that is doing amazing things. Um, I believe they get some funding from the college, uh, from the university. It's considered like a student club um, and it's completely student led. So they lead um, drop in yoga classes, meditation classes. They bring um, keynotes and speakers to campus to talk about mental health and mindfulness and meditation. They have events. It's a fantastic. Um, they're doing really great things out there. So I'm hoping to maybe um, get connected with student government and get get that rolling here on our campus and maybe inspire others across the country to do the same thing. Mm, yeah. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah I, you know I that they can... meditation, mindfulness practices, they don't cost anything, right? So it's it's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's always a room on campus that you can use for those kind of gatherings, oh, yeah. so. Absolutely. Yeah, I wasn't aware that Washington was doing that. That's very cool. I know Stanford does. Oh, um, I have to look them up. Yeah, and they have a really great program. They also do a lot of uh, adult education programming, okay. which is really cool. Yeah. And um, something I'm planning on doing this this fall yeah. is taking some classes oh, at Stanford. Fantastic. Pretty cool. That's very cool. Yeah. I'm in yeah. That's awesome. So we said we were going to talk about communications. <laughs> yes. So let's segue a little sure. bit. But you teach communications. I so do. how can we apply mindfulness mm -hmm. to how we communicate and how we actually use that for business messaging? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said earlier, my background is in communication. All three mm -hmm. of my degrees are in communication. So I found my niche early. Um, and so I've taught in the I've taught communication courses for the past 10 years. And most recently, I've been teaching a business communication course in our college's school of business. Um, and that's been really fantastic because it's expanded um, my expertise and my perspective in the field of communication, because as you can imagine, the field of communication is gigantic. Um, you know, some people view it as like broadcasting, some view it as public relations and marketing. You know, my expertise was actually an in interpersonal communication. So the communication between people and how we use communication to uh, cultivate and maintain relationships. And so what I've really enjoyed is marrying the discipline of interpersonal communication with business communication, because I think one of the things that's really lacking still, it's changing, it's getting better, but still lacking is the recognition of the importance of relationship building in business. Um, a lot of times we're so focused on the end result um, that we lose sight of the process to get there. And oftentimes what's the most important factor in that process is building relationships. And so that's where I think mindfulness comes into play is with that relationship building. Um, I think that a lot of times um, one of the things that, that's missing in business and in our relationships in general is mindful listening. I think a lot of times we claim 
that we listen. And if you ask us, we'll say, oh, I'm a great listener. I listen actively every single day and to lots and lots of people. But I'd be willing to bet that we're probably not actually listening. Um, it's hard. You know, we have so mm -hmm. much in our minds, so many distractions in our environments that I think a lot of times what we think is listening is just kind of hearing. We're hearing somebody talk. We're picking up on some of the words and interpreting some of the meaning, but we're not really focused on that person or those people that we're conversing with. And that's what mindful listening is. It's being mm -hmm in tuned with another individual and really truly listening to what they have to say and being curious about their their perspectives and their thoughts and their opinions and really genuinely wanting to hear more. Um, that's mindful listening. And I think that businesses can benefit from mindful listening, whether that's with a, um, a client one on one, whether that's with your, you know, communicating with your board, whether that's on social media, right, truly listening mm -hmm. to your customers or your clients. Um, people have a lot to say. And when they feel like they're being listened to, when they feel like their voice is being heard, I think mm -hmm. that makes people um, more loyal customers, brand ambassadors uh, that can move mountains. So I think a lot of the mindfulness comes back to, to listening. I couldn't agree with that more. It's really, I, I was listening to a TED talk. Yeah that uh, and I can't remember the woman's name, but she was talking about the qualities of listening. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she brought out was we all have that urge, you know, that as we're listening to a conversation, something sparks our brain and we can't wait to say what we got to say. And we're so focused on that that we, we forget the whole conversation, except the thing that we wanted to say. I'm very guilty of this and I try really hard not to be, but we all are, right? But it was interesting that what it sparked in me is when you're watching a really great interviewer, they sometimes will stop and write down a note. And to my mind, that's a way of remembering what it was that triggered your brain. So you can let go of that and go back to listening mm -hmm. instead of hanging on to it in case you forget it. Um, and that was one of the things that she said was, you know, just if you if you have a thought about what that person is saying, recognize that you had a thought and then let it go and go back to listening, because the whole conversation is completely different if you don't actively listen. It's very hard to practice. <laughs> it is very it's hard practice. to practice, but like you just said, it is practice. Um, and mm -hmm. unless we're willing to put forth that conscious effort to get better at listening, it's not going to happen. So we really do very consciously have to pay attention to the sensations in our body, the thoughts in our mind, um, the distractions in our environment, and really work on limiting the impact that it has on our engagement and our attention to the conversation. Um, and I think that's where mindfulness comes into play so that people who practice mindfulness, um, particularly meditation, I think are, are really better equipped to minimize the distractions because mm -hmm. when you're meditating, um, you are learning to be in the present moment and not allow thoughts of the past or worries about the future or, you know, you, you, the dog in the next room or the noisy bus outside your window. You're not allowing that to interfere with your feelings of being in the present. And I think we can apply that to listening, um, mm -hmm. that that practice will help us be better listeners and therefore um, better relationship builders and maintainers. Mm. And I, I think that's especially true with social media as well, you know, because we get so distracted by social media and all the different things going on. And we tend to multitask. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I teach is about multitasking, that it's just total bullshit. Quit doing it. Oh, it is. Oh, it you know, is. having your email open and Twitter and Facebook all at the same time is just too distracting for anyone to get any work done. Oh yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I teach my students the same thing because I really think, I think this idea of multitasking has um, enveloped all of us as a culture, but I really think younger generations are especially susceptible to the belief that they're capable of multitasking. Mm. I've found with my college age students that they genuinely believe 
that they can multitask, that they can have the TV on and study or what have you. Um, but I, you know, try to present them with the research, like you said, that it is, it's BS. We, our brains are not capable of doing that. Um, and so I think that, that, that multitasking, that belief that we can do that, and then all the distractions that we have brought into our, our day-to-day -day worlds, that it's, it's serving as a barrier uh, between being truly mindful um, versus being distracted. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and mm. I think with social media, um, you know, I know that I'm guilty of it too, where, you know, we switch on our, you know, I'm on my phone and I'm switching between um, Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and then back to my email and all that switching back and forth just diverts your attention and really negatively affects your concentration so that you're ineffective on all of those platforms. Um, so I, I like to really try to force myself to do one communication medium at a time. So if mm -hmm. I'm going to do Twitter, I'm only going to look at Twitter and I'm going to really try to be mindful about my communication on Twitter. So how many of us uh, have seen a headline, thought it sounded catchy and relevant to our followers and just retweeted it without reading it? Mm -hmm. I've done it, right? Um Guilty. Right, exactly. Um, I would say the more mindful practice would be to actually read that article <laughs> and decide if it truly is relevant, if, you know, it truly is a really good article that your audience would want to read. And then don't simply retweet it, but add a comment about it, explaining mm -hmm. why it's relevant or explaining why it's awesome or important. Right. I mean, something as simple as that that tiny little interaction or that tiny bit of communication, I think that's more mindful. Um, and so we can do that across social media as well, not just in person. I absolutely agree. Cause you know, a lot of times and I'm as guilty as the next person of, of blindly retweeting usually because it's someone I know and respect. Yes. But the thing is, is that most people don't recognize that the tweet that you just sent is actually a retweet. So they actually ascribe that to you. So if they click the link and it doesn't resonate with them, then you didn't resonate with them. Yeah. So it's really important that we remember what we're communicating and how we're communicating. Yeah. Um, you know, that it's tacit support of whatever that message is. Yep. Um, it, it's an interesting thing, the way that sharing has developed across social platforms, Facebook and Twitter in particular, that, you know, we kind of align ourselves with the people that we admire and respect. And so people kind of align us, even though we may not even know each other. Mm -hmm. So it's Absolutely. pretty interesting. Absolutely. I mean, our, the way that we communicate, what we communicate is going to directly um, affect people's perceptions of us. I mean, that's face-to-face -face or online. So what you tweet and how you tweet it, mm -hmm. um, not only just what the content is, but actually the words that you use or the strategy that you employ, that's going to communicate a lot about you. And in the case of business, about your brand. Um, so you want to make sure that you're being very conscious and mindful about what and how you're communicating uh, in digital spaces. Yeah. Ooh, that leads me to a really good question. Yeah. How do we as communicators talk about our brand and keep the brand identity and the brand messaging all in line while we're actually being mindful of our audience who really doesn't care about our messaging? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> Off to you. Yeah. Um, well, I think that, I don't know, people may disagree, but I really do believe that once we have kind of established a brand and what that brand represents, what it values, what's its what its mission is, what its purpose is. Um, I think that we have to stick to that throughout all of our communications. It has to be consistent, um, and I think that actually that consistency can translate to people to our audiences um, becoming maybe more loyal to our brand because they see that consistency. And I think a lot of times in our minds, people associate consistency with anything like integrity or trust. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that we're not waffling or wavering between values or ideas, or we're not using different communication styles that they know what to expect 
when they visit us on our blog or on Twitter or on Facebook, they know what to expect of us. Um, I think that when we see kind of brands experimenting with different styles or strategies that sometimes it can put people off because they're like, whoa, that's not what I expected. And that's not why I came here. And that's not why I follow you. Um, I see this on Instagram a lot um, recently with um, the, the, the Brexit controversy with the European Union and the UK. Um, I follow several bloggers on Instagram who their brand is about, you know, anything from like fashion to, you know, nutrition and wellness and those sorts of things. And when they start talking about politics, then people, you know, explicitly comment saying this, like, actually, I've seen the comment, this is not why I follow you. Mm. You know, and so I actually think that when we stick, when we choose a voice, when we choose how we present our brand, that if we stick with it, that that actually encourages our audience to stick with us as well. Um, that's not to say that we can't develop and change, but I think when we're trying to make a change to our brand and to our the voice that we present on social media, that we have to be really careful and conscious about how we do it. Um, so I think that um, that's one way that we can actually build and keep an audience is to to keep our messages and our strategies consistent. No, oh, that's, that's really great. I, um, I, think I think it happens a lot across platforms too, because on one platform, the voice may be very different than on another platform, not just like the difference between LinkedIn and Twitter, but you know, now we look at Snapchat and the audience that you're talking to is extremely different than yeah. it is on LinkedIn, for example. Oh yes. Drastic example. Yeah. Um, and so you have to figure out how you can modify your voice to fit each platform without violating those brand messaging guidelines that you've already got set up. But yeah. someone very carefully created. Yes. Whatever. That was. And, and I would agree with you that that's that's really challenging to do. I'm, you know, as I espouse the, these things, the importance of consistency and those sorts of things. I'm not saying it's easy um, mm -hmm. because it is hard to maintain a thread, that thread of brand voice or that thread of consistency across all platforms, but then make those tweaks to make it especially relevant and attractive to your audience. That's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for example, I, uh, one of my favorite examples of, of brand voice, especially on Twitter, is, is Taco Bell. I don't know if you've ever scrolled through their their Twitter feed, but it is fantastic for brand voice and consistency. Um, and so, you know, I, I like to use them in class as an example of that. And they're pretty consistent in their communications and their style um, across multiple platforms. But they may have an easier time doing that because, um, you know, the brand voice that they have chosen is very young and hip, a little bit snarky. I mean, truly a little bit of an attitude creeps in there, um, but their audience loves it. And so that type of voice is easier to translate from mm -hmm. Twitter to Facebook to Snapchat, right? But if you have, you know, a brand that maybe is a little bit more traditional, that's going to be more challenging to also be hip and cool on Snapchat, but also be traditional and a little bit more reserved um, on other platforms. So it mm -hmm. is challenging. Yeah. Well, and what do you think about multiple platforms? Does every brand need to be on every platform? No, absolutely not. It's a rhetorical um, question. But yeah, <laughs> I, I really, I mean, I have heard, I have heard some PR marketing experts say that you should. I completely disagree. And I think mm -hmm. for the most part, I think most people take that perspective. I think that you have to think about what your brand is, what the purpose of your business is, um, and then who your audience, who your audiences are. And most of us will have multiple audiences, not just one group of people, um, mm -hmm. where those audiences go and what makes sense with what those audiences want and need, what problems they need solved. Um, some problems can't be solved on Twitter. Some issues can't be discussed on Snapchat. I mean, so I think it completely depends on the brand, the purpose of the business, and who your audience is. Um, I, I think 
I think we sometimes see businesses spreading themselves too thin, especially mm -hmm. small businesses. I mean, small businesses don't have a social media team that they can devote to only communicating on social media. A lot of times it falls to one employee or the business owner themselves. And so if you're trying to be all things to all people on all platforms, Mm -hmm. you're going to burn out quickly and you're not going to be effective. I mean, I think that goes back to once again, mindfulness and being able to devote yourself fully and completely to certain modes of communication. And if we're trying to do them all, we're only going to be able to do it superficially. We're not going to be able to really engage in that mindful listening, um, in that relationship building with our audience members. Um, I, so I think you have to be choosy about what platforms you use. Yeah, I think people do tend to spread themselves too thin. They also seem to think, you know, that someone will tell them, and, you know, this is a consultant problem, <laughs> being a consultant, that, you know, the consultant said we had to be on Facebook or that we had to run ads or that we had to, you know, be on Snapchat or YouTube. But if you aren't capable or don't want to or don't have the content to create appropriate content for that platform, yeah. then you shouldn't do it because once you buy in and you're vested in that network, you're kind of stuck it's with it yeah. or you have to abandon it and delete the account or you look really stupid really? like you started yeah. and didn't know what to do. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and we've all, you know, seen examples where I, I kind of I, I phrase it as they're trying really hard. You know, like <laughs> it's just obvious that they're trying really, really hard to be, you know, when I think of Instagram, I think of, you know, flat lay photographs of beautiful things, right? And so, like, if you're like an airline, you know, what are you going to flat lay? You know, like, here's a bag of pretzels and here's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I think you have to, you have to really think about what your, what your business purpose is, what your brand voice is, and what you think you can do well um, and where you think your audience members are. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, I, I think it depends too on the creativity of the particular yeah. brand and, yeah. and their sense of humor. Like I think, you know, American Air does pretty well on Instagram because they talk about their planes, they talk about the people, but right. they tell stories. stories. And yeah. I think that's you know the next thing that I wanted to ask you about was the role of storytelling in real mindful communication as opposed to I have to I have to mention that I was on um, CM World chat on Twitter just before this mm -hmm. and they were talking about how uh, messaging kind of is created and whether or not, you know, there's a, there's a good flow there or not. And so, you know, where, where is that line and where is journalism start and content creation begin? It's all about the story. Yeah. So is it more about journalism? Is it more about messaging? It was well, a long way to get to this question. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, in many ways, I think there's kind of like a line in the sand. Um, I, I think that there is so much overlap now with journalism and content creation. Um, I know a lot of journalists would disagree, um, but I really do because like you said, at the heart of it, at the heart of journalism is mm -hmm. storytelling. And at the heart of what should be content creation should be storytelling. Um, I, I really believe that. I think human beings are natural storytellers. We've been telling stories since, you know, the beginning of time, practically. Mm -hmm. And and that's the way that we've communicated historically. And so when people tell stories, um, we experience emotions. Uh, and so when you are writing a, an article for The Washington Post, you want people to um, experience uh, the perspectives and the emotions of the people featured in the story. And we, when we read a piece of content, whether that's a tweet or, you know, an article on a blog or whatever, we want our audience to experience emotions as well, because we all like to think that we're very rational people. And that we, <laughs> you know, that I'm we not. Right. We <laughs> thoroughly and we make very rational decisions. Nine times out of ten, our 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 actions, our decisions are based purely on our emotions. Yes. Um, so, and that relates a lot to business because if we can get people feeling something, then we can get them to um, comply with our call to action. Um, and so, I think storytelling is at the heart of both. 
And I think mindful storytelling is actually a really interesting concept uh, that I hadn't thought about before, before you brought it up. But I think there are some nice connections because I think with storytelling, um, with the appeal to emotions, there's that appeal to empathy. And empathy is a huge component, I believe, of mindfulness, because when you can um, when you can feel what another person feels, when you can step in their shoes, see the pers- their perspective, I think that that builds those relationships, that builds connections. Um, mm. And that, you know, I think that that empathy is a, a core component of both storytelling and mindfulness. So to combine those, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, think I think it's, it's I think it's really, really essential, essential that we, we do, do have that them. empathy for the people that we're talking to. And we know that that differs per platform. It dis- differs per demographic. Sure. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the challenge is to tell a story that can reach multiple demographics without pissing off this demographic and making that demographic crazy, you know, this whole thing. And it gets so much more complicated when we're dealing with larger audiences and multiple platforms oh, so sure. finding ways to you know pull that story together and have it be something that can be that can relate is that a story that is about the consumer of the product or is it a story about the problem that they're solving where really is kind of the root of that story yeah i was as you were saying that i was thinking about um uh, i was thinking about how um there are possibly some universal um, problems or universal challenges or universal emotions that I think human beings experience and Mm. deal with rather than um, certain specific demographics. Um, You know, I think that, you know, all of us could probably identify a problem or a challenge that we have encountered um, that we've sought a solution for. And so I think, um, I think it's, I don't know if this is the the wimpy way out, but I think it's kind of both. I think it's a story about the problem, but I also think it's a story about human beings um, mm. because I think they're pretty intricately connected that the experience of being human is oftentimes the experience of trying to overcome challenges and persevere. Um, so, I mean, we all love, I mean, think about, we all love an underdog, Right. We mm-hmm. love movies and stories that deal with the underdog, you know, grappling and struggling with challenges and then making it in the end. Right. I think that's a pretty universal storyline. Um, so I do think that there are some some common um, experiences and some common feelings that we can tell stories about that relate both to problems and also to our audiences. Um, you know, I, so I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when you say this movies, you know, and we talk about movies all the time as being part of, you know, kind of something that guides us and is an easy way to explain how stories flow. Mm-hmm. That when we talk about the old style marketing, in old style marketing, the hero was the product. Oh, yeah. And in new marketing, what I like to think of as new marketing, yeah. the hero is the user. Yeah. The hero is the person that we want to talk to. We want to make them feel good about using the product. We want them to feel good about solving their problem so they can get on with their life. It's not, we don't want people to stop what they're doing and praise be to our product. Right. It's stop what you're doing. Notice that you can fix what you've got and move on. Yeah. And And that's what we're all looking for, I think. Yeah. And that we we can relate to the hero or heroine um, that we see ourselves in that person. I think Mm -hmm. that's vital. I think that when we, when the product was the hero of the story, I think it was oftentimes really hard for audiences to connect and relate on that kind of human level. Um, Whereas when, when businesses uh, are able to craft a story where we can connect with that, that hero or heroine that I think that that makes all the difference in the world because, you know, we are, 
consumers are much more likely to buy a product or a service if it comes recommended from somebody that we're close to. And typically people that we're close to are like us. We know from psychology that we tend to form relationships based on similarity. And so if we see a similar person in a story, then we are much more likely, I think, to be willing to consider a purchase of some kind. Because once again, going back to empathy, that if we can see ourselves in that person or we relate to that person, there's that empathy going on. Mm -hmm. And there's also the feeling of nostalgia. Uh, I don't remember who it was. It could have been Seth Godin was talking about marketing to different age demographics and that, you know, if you're marketing to the over 50 crowd, then you may not be using, you know, more popular current music. You may be using, you may put a 65 Mustang in there and you might have a little Rolling Stones music. <laughs> things that are nostalgic for our age group or well, my age group, um, you know, you can go back to that and it, it, it softens the market, sure. you know, and allows you to tell them the story. Mm -hmm. So finding ways that you can, can work that in can be really helpful too. Yeah. I mean, we, at the end of the day, we all want to feel good. We want to, you know, feel pleasure and avoid pain. I mean, that's, you know, that's what it comes to at the end of the day. So I think storytelling that makes us feel good is going to result in positive outcomes. Um, and so and hopefully, you know, that results in a purchase being made. And then that purchase is going to help alleviate the problem or the challenge that the mm -hmm. consumer is facing, not just a purchase for a purchase's sake. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about building customer loyalty and also evangelism. Mm -hmm. And how can we do that with social media specifically in a more mindful way mm -hmm. to encourage people to help us spread the word? I, I think it, it I, I really believe it goes back to that listening. I think that using social media particularly um, as a as a way to listen to your audience. Uh, I think that that um, is one of the biggest strengths of the tool of social media um, to use it for listening purposes. Because I think if we really pay attention, our audiences are giving us a lot of useful mm -hmm. information. A lot of times companies, unfortunately, are not willing to listen. Um, they don't have the time or the resources or they don't think that it's important or, you know, I'm amazed at how many CEOs and other executives still to this day dismiss the usefulness of social media for their company, that it's just fluff, you know, that, you know, what's It'll pass. Yeah, I just, I'm still, it still boggles my mind that there are still so many people in leadership positions who have that perspective because people are just revealing their souls on social media. They are just, they are telling us what they need. They are telling us what they want, what their desires and hopes and dreams are, if we're only willing to pay attention. Um, so I think that is one of the biggest benefits of social media and being active on social media is to use it as a way to listen um, and really pay attention and focus on what our customers or our clients are telling us. And then using that information to um, create stories, uh, to create messages that our audiences are going to relate to and connect to, um, to build those emotional reactions and that empathy. And so um, I think that that listening, that mindful listening, really focusing, really paying attention and having genuine, sincere interest in what our customers are saying, I think that makes all the difference in the world. I really think that that's what distinguishes really successful companies from, you know, maybe just, you know, averagely successful companies is mm -hmm. their willingness to listen and then use that information to turn around and craft messages and products that really are going to fulfill some kind of need in their audience's lives. Yeah. So that brings me to another interesting challenge that a lot of bigger brands have is that there's so much noise going on out there about them, their brand, their products. Maybe they have a lot of products. And so what they tend to do is set up a lot of social media listening tools that basically just gather a lot of data that then never really gets processed. Mm 
-hmm. You know, they get the data, but they think of it more on the lines of a demographic information. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if we get so many negative responses about this particular product, then we may do something about that. Right. But it isn't really active listening. So how, how do you think that a corporation can implement more active listening than just data gathering and processing? And it, what do you think about the difference between those two? Yeah, because I, I do think, um, I mean, and gosh, higher ed to draw the comparison, um, <laughs> higher ed is notorious <laughs> for collecting data mm -hmm. and then doing nothing with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're at the college that I'm at right now, we're in the process of, you know, of assessment um, and accreditation and those sorts of things. And we're just collecting all this data. And, you know, I wonder where it goes and what we do with it. And I think it's the same for big corporations as well. They collect, mm -hmm. they collect all this data, they're told they need data, um, but then they don't really do much with it. So I really think that before you even collect the data that whoever's on your social media team or your public relations or your, your marketing team really has to have a, a discussion about what the goals are. What are, what are you hoping to get from this listening? What are you hoping to get from the data? How are you going to use it? So what outcomes are you are you working towards? And then you can, I think you can devise a better strategy for actually collecting the things that will help you achieve those outcomes. Um, I'm amazed at how how many companies I think just dive into data collection. And you're right, they get overwhelmed by the sheer amount of it mm -hmm. and how all over the place it is. When if they started backed up a little bit and started with some concrete goals and making a better plan, um, that I think that they would have much more manageable and useful data. Um, I do think that with really big companies that a lot of times it does come down to resources that mm -hmm. you have to be able to convince executives that um, more resources are needed for this type of practice. I think you need more people. A lot of times when you don't have um, enough people to do the listening and the data analysis that it does become overwhelming and objectives aren't met. But when you have a really good team who has those concrete goals in mind, um, and knows what outcomes you're working for towards that, I think it's a little bit more effective. Um, so I think when you're at that level of such a large multifaceted corporation, it, a lot of times it does come down to resources. Mm -hmm. Well, and yes, get a plan. I, yeah. I can't count the number of times that I've gone into an organization and they've said, well, oh, we've been running X great big humongous data collection tool yeah. and here's the data. What do and we it's do? Like a year of data and they haven't looked at it. They don't know what it says and they don't know how to sort it at this point. Sure. There's no plan at all. It's yeah. just let's gather all the data and let's spend tons of money because that will solve our problem. Right. That's a sales problem. It is. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's amazing. You know how many people have a perspective. Let's just throw some data at it. Right. And mm -hmm. solve everything. And that's so not the case. Um, and uh, so I think that a process of not only having a plan and setting those concrete goals, but in that plan, have benchmarks and look at that data more frequently Mm -hmm. Then, you know, like, oh, it's a f the end of the fiscal year. Let's look at this gigantic data set. Well, why don't you set some quarterly benchmarks and look at the data periodically? Weekly. Then not only, yeah, weekly. Yeah, exactly. For some mm. companies, definitely um, the amount of information that they're gathering. Um, because then you, it's not only more manageable, but you, I think you become more in tune to trends. Um, yes. Whereas if you're just looking at this massive data set, you're not going to be able to pick out, I think, as many um, as many nuances that might be useful mm -hmm. um, to product development or marketing or communications. Um, so I think having those more specific um, time limits, I think, would be useful as well. And in listening to your brand ambassadors listening, you know, there is a lot of chatter and there's a lot of people who are talking about your products and your brand and maybe 75% of it isn't really useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it could be. So being able to identify who are our true loyal customers and what are they saying? 
And what are they telling other people? I think that if you want a place to start, that's oftentimes a great place to start is with your brand ambassadors because um, they oftentimes have used your products or your services for a long time. They're relatively devoted. Um, they might have some really good insight. Um, that might be a good place to start as well if you're kind of swimming in the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the way good brand ambassadors or evangelists really are dedicated to a product. And I love to see a brand giving them support because yeah. I think a lot of times they expect it. Oh, you know, yes. They, they just, well, yeah. well, we'll pay these people for one blog post and they'll be ours for life. Oh, yeah. And that does not happen. Does not and, happen. you know, especially when you start paying for brand ambassadors to, you know, talk about your product, then the people who are following them know that they're paid because you yes. have to disclose it. Yes. And so it totally tweaks things. So, okay. you know, what's your opinion on supporting brand ambassadors, whether you're giving them product or you're paying them money? Um, well, how do you feel about that? You know, I have really mixed feelings about it. I I think that there's a, a place for paying for brand ambassadors uh, to talk about your brand. However, I do think that if that's what you're relying on, then you're not going to be as successful because I really do think consumers have become much more critical. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I think that with the sheer amount of information that we have at our fingertips, um, that consumers are much more likely to, you know, want real, honest information about a product or a service. And that's I think that's why a lot of times we are more influenced by our peers, people in our network, word of mouth, than we are by the marketing done by the company. I think there's been a lot of consciousness raising about, you know, the ethics of advertising over the years. And people have gotten a little suspicious, mm -hmm. I think. I know that I'll use a, a really simple example. When you go to Amazon and you're reading the reviews of a product on Amazon um, and they have to disclose that they received the item for free, for example. Mm -hmm. I know I oftentimes will not pay as close attention to those reviews because I feel like their opinions were influenced in some way. And maybe mm -hmm. it was totally unconscious. Maybe they, they got the product for free and they really honest to goodness reviewed it and they um, you know, are speaking their truth. Maybe that is the case, but mm -hmm. I think at a subconscious level, you're somehow influenced, somehow biased. I don't think that we can get away from that. And so I think that a lot of people are, are don't take those types of reviews or those types of testimonials as seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Or it lends an, a, a, the same type of credibility to someone who received no type of compensation. Um, so I do think that that really has to be considered and brands have to be really careful about that. A lot of times, I think it just comes down to people being noticed. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think a lot of brand ambassadors, loyal customers need to be compensated to speak about your brand. I think that if you are providing a quality product or quality service that you prioritize customer service, um, I think that people are going to, to talk about you, whether you give them something or not. But I think you have to um, reward them, for lack of a better word, with support, attention, with support, yeah. with interaction, with relationship building. Um, so that may be something as simple as, um, you know, on Instagram, regramming a picture that somebody took where they are using your product, right? Mm -hmm. Or complimenting them on Twitter or answering a question that they have in a Facebook forum, something as simple as that, because there is so much clutter and there are are so many people talking all at once on social media that for a brand to reach out to you and say, I notice you, I think a lot of people are pretty swayed by that. It makes They are. 
it matters a lot to people when the brand reaches out to them. And, you know, I think there's, I think there's context for all of it. If I see a blog post and, you know, they clearly receive the product and they gave it a great review, not because they know about that particular category of product or they know about the product, but because they were told they needed to review it. And all of the, all of the text on their uh, blog post looks like they cut and pasted it out of a press release. Right. Yeah. Absolutely no flag. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there are a lot of cases where people have, you know, received product because they're interested in that particular area or they have expertise in that area. Then I can kind of see it. They still have to disclose. Yes. But if they have a legitimate need for the product, um, you know, and this like, hey, I just, you know, tried out this new toaster and I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Boy, that was really <laughs> that weird. was good. That was good. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that kind of um, evangelism, people do go, oh, OK, you know, she's an expert on toast. Yes. So, you know, but but I think there's a lot of cases where it's very obvious that especially with bloggers who tend to cover, you know, 90 different products in a month, mm -hmm. they're just doing it for the money. And yeah. I don't respect that. Right. And I think, you know, we have to as consumers, we have to be really careful and critical about the information that we're consuming. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we're not. Um, and so I think that goes back to mindfulness as well. So not just businesses communicating mindfully, but consumers consuming information mindfully. Oh, yes. And, you know, I, I, I practicing that digital citizenship, you know, that we all know that just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that bloggers and, and other individuals are required to disclose mm -hmm. um, whether or not they receive some, some sort of compensation. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we can apply mindfulness to being a consumer as well, really paying attention. I mean, I think that's what mindfulness boils down to is paying attention. Mm -hmm. That's all that it is. I think we a lot of times we go through life just coasting, just relying on habit that we don't pay attention. So I think as consumers, we have to start paying attention. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, yeah. and I'm so glad we met on Twitter. <laughs> me, too. me too. Why don't you tell people how they can find you sure. and uh, where they can let you know if they want to blog on your blog? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> So, um, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, the Peaceful Professor is a new project. Uh, it's just getting off the ground. Uh, I'm always looking for people to contribute to it. So if you have your own mindfulness practice, um, you have found something that really works for you and you want to share that practice. Or um, if you are an educator who uses mindfulness techniques in the classroom or you're a researcher who studies mindfulness or meditation and concepts related to mental health and stress relief and those sorts of topics, um, please reach out to me. I would love to collaborate with you. Um, so uh, my email is thepeacefulprofessor, all one word, at gmail.com. And as we said earlier, my Twitter handle is uh, the Peaceful Prof. Uh, and so you can find me on Twitter. Uh, and I also have a, a, a Twitter account that I use for if you're more interested in education related topics, especially in higher ed. Um, I also maintain a Twitter handle called Past Prof. Um, so it's P A S T underscore P R O F. So you'll see mm -hmm. the professor theme across my social <laughs> media. Um, so yeah, please reach out if you're interested. I'd love to, to talk with you. I'd love to collaborate with you. Well, great. Well, thank you again for uh, coming on the show. It was really a pleasure. And uh, just for everybody to know, this will be on YouTube. It will also be on uh, Spreaker. And if you look on the blog at mindfulsocialmarketing.com, you can find the replay and the links to those recordings. Thanks so much, Dana, for having me. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. And I look forward